All right, so our last chapter, um, there's gonna be the urinary system. And again, we'll have two parts to the chapter. By the end of the chapter, you guys should be able to describe the anatomy of the kidney, which you should already have a pretty good grasp on from lab. Um, and then also to be able to really in good detail describe the path that blood takes as it flows through the kidney and understanding kind of like what's happening in each area. So how it gets out to the cortex, what tiny vessels it flows through in the cortex, how it comes out of the cortex, um, again, including physiology and all of that. You guys should be able to describe the structure and function of the nephron in detail. We'll talk a ton about the nephron and the tubules, the different parts of the tubules and the glomerulus. And you guys should be really familiar with that. We've got two different types of nephrons, cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons. You should be able to compare and contrast the different types of nephrons, both structure and function. Talk a little bit about the juxtaglomerular complex, which we'll see releases things like erythropoietin and renin and adenosine. Um, and we'll mention how all of those different um, factors affect the kidney itself. You should be able to talk about what renal threshold is and then see why that's important clinically. We'll talk a lot about the actual process of glomerular filtration and something called glomerular filtration rate or GFR. If you work in a hospital or a doctor's office, I'm sure you've seen this term GFR before. Um, that's a good way to monitor kidney function. So we'll talk a lot about GFR, the ways that GFR can be changed, why that matters, etc. And then finally, we'll finish up with a, a short discussion of urine transport, storage, and elimination. Um, most of this is going to be is going to be today, um, and then the GFR is a huge discussion, and then urine transport will all be the, uh, the second lecture. So we're talking about the urinary system, right? The urinary system obviously has something to do with urine. Um, it starts here in the two kidneys, the right and left kidney, which is where we filter blood and produce urine. Right? We take waste and extra stuff out of the bloodstream and we put it into this fluid, which is called urine. The urine collects in these two tubes, which are called ureters, and the ureters carry that urine down to the bladder. The bladder, remember, is a muscular sac that can expand and store that urine until we're ready, ready to release it from the body. And when we release it from the body, we do so via one single tube called the urethra. So here you see in the female, a relatively short urethra leading out of the body. Um, we'll see that the urethra is much longer in males because it travels down the length of the penis. And then in males, not only urine exits through the urethra, but semen as well. So when a male ejaculates, um, the ejaculatory fluid, which includes the sperm, will be released via the urethra. So the same tube that the urine is released from. So we can be very, very broad and bland and say that the urinary system has three major functions, excretion, elimination, and homeostatic regulation. So excretion, remember, is just the removal of organic wastes from our body fluids. So we have wastes like urea um, that are present in our blood and in our interstitial fluid, and we remove those wastes by excreting them right, or, or pumping or releasing them into the urine. Okay, so that's important to get wastes and toxins, um, extra ions, all of that out of the blood and into the urine. Elimination is also important. So the urinary system is important for, actually I'll add storage here as well. So we'll say storage and elimination of urine. And so we store urine in the bladder. That's pretty important. You don't want to leak urine all day, right? You make urine constantly. And the last thing you want is to just be leaking it and seeping it out of you. It's important to be able to store it and then release mass amounts at a time for convenience sake. So we store the urine and then we eliminate it, right? We get it out of the body via a process called micturition, which is just what? Urination. Urination. Right, just getting it out of the body. This last one here is a lot more complicated than it sounds. Um, so we'll talk about it over the next few slides. But the, the urinary system and the kidney is really in particular 
are extremely important for the homeostatic regulation of the blood. Remember we said the kidneys filter the blood, right? They, they filter extra stuff out of the bloodstream and put it in the urine so that we can get it out of the body. That directly controls concentrations, ion levels, fluid levels, waste levels of the bloodstream. Okay, so the uh, urinary system is extremely important when we start to look at homeostatic regulation of the blood. Again, this is really dynamic. Um, <clears throat> and it includes the regulation of lots of different compounds. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about it. So kind of the most obvious here is that the urinary system is important in regulating blood volume and blood pressure. Okay, and this is in a couple different ways. We filter fluid out of the blood and put it into the urine, right? So if we filter more fluid out of the blood, we're gonna decrease blood volume. If we filter less fluid out of the blood, we're not gonna decrease blood volume, right? We're gonna maintain blood volume. So the kidney's production of urine directly relates to how much volume we have in our bloodstream. Okay, so the kidneys are extremely important for regulating blood volume um, by adjusting how much water we lose in the urine. And remember, blood volume then directly relates to blood pressure, right? The more volume we have, the more pressure we have. Now the kidneys or the urinary system are also important for um, regulating blood volume and blood pressure because we'll see there's something called the juxta glomerular complex. And the juxtaglomerular complex releases erythropoietin and renin. Both of those should be somewhat familiar. Um, what does erythropoietin stimulate? Red blood cell production or erythropoiesis. Right, so what would that do to blood volume? Increase it, right? Your red blood cells make up about half of your blood volume. So if you make more red blood cells, you can increase your blood volume. Um, what ultimate effect does renin end up having on blood pressure? <laughs> this is super important. It increases it. Okay, renin, remember, we'll talk about this a lot later, but it ultimately leads to the activation of angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 increases blood volume and increases blood pressure. Okay, so the kidneys can adjust these things just simply based on water. How much water do we get rid of? How much water do we keep? And then they can also indirectly affect blood volume and blood pressure by releasing these other compounds, erythropoietin and renin. The urinary system is also important for regulating plasma ion concentrations. Again, the most obvious way they do that is just controlling how much we get rid of in the urine, right? At the kidneys, that's where we filter extra stuff out of the blood and put it in the urine. So if we have extra sodium, we'll put it in the urine. If we have extra potassium, we put it in the urine. If we have extra chloride, we put it in the urine, right? Or the opposite, if we don't have enough, we reabsorb it back into the bloodstream and we do not get rid of it in the urine. So the kidneys directly control how much of these ions we lose in the urine and how much we retain in the body, right? So that's super important for regulating the concentrations of these ions in the body. Now the kidneys also have um, kind of a, a secondary or an extra effect on calcium concentrations. Okay, so they, we have calcium that gets filtered out of the urine or gets held back. Right, so calcium's controlled just like these other ions. But in addition to that, remember that the hormone calcitriol is actually made in the kidneys. Okay, remember when we have parathyroid hormone present? Parathyroid hormone tells the kidneys that they should make calcitriol. And what does calcitriol do? Mm -hmm. So it increases calcium. Absorption from what? I'm so glad we have a final exam that's needed um, for retention. Calcitriol increases calcium absorption from the GI tract. Okay, remember, we don't have enough calcium, so parathyroid hormone is released. PTH goes to the kidney, 
and at the kidney, that PTH is gonna increase reabsorption of calcium so we don't pee out. And at the kidney, we make calcitriol. That calcitriol then goes to the intestines and absorbs even more D3. I mean, sorry, it's made from D3, absorbs even more calcium. Okay? So the urinary system is important for regulating blood volume and blood pressure. The urinary system is important for regulating plasma ion concentrations. It's also important for stabilizing blood pH. Just like we can control the ions that we get rid of in the urine or that we reabsorb back into the body, we can control um, the retention or the loss of hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. So hydrogen ions and bicarb is HCO3 minus. This bicarb likes to take hydrogen ions away. It likes to, to take hydrogen ions in. So because of that, it acts like a base, right? Like it decreases the amount of hydrogen ions. So it would make things less acidic, right, or more basic. And remember, hydrogen ions are acidic. The more hydrogen ions, the more acidic something is. So at the kidneys, we can control the loss of hydrogen or bicarbonate ions into the urine. Okay? And by controlling how many we lose, we're also influencing how many we retain. So we influence the actual pH of the bloodstream. So if we got rid of hydrogen ions, in the urine, what would we be doing to the pH? Increasing it, right? Making it more basic because we're getting rid of those hydrogen ions. What about if we got rid of bicarbonate ions? If we we're getting rid of bicarbonate in the urine, pH would be more acidic, right? Good. The urinary system is also important because it allows us to conserve nutrients. So things like glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, minerals, all these useful things we're able to conserve while we still get rid of waste products. Okay, and this is important. So when the kidneys filter all the stuff out of the blood, right, to go into the urine, we're just filtering based on size. So there's a lot of good stuff that gets filtered out, but we don't urinate all of that out. We're able to decide what we want to keep and what we want to get rid of. And that's extremely important. We don't want to be losing glucose and amino acids and fatty acids and all this good stuff in our urine all day, right? We need that stuff. So our kidneys are able to get rid of the waste while reabsorbing or while conserving all of these nutrients. Okay? And that's extremely important. Um, finally, the urinary system helps to detoxify the body and eliminate wastes. Okay, so when we talk about getting wastes or toxins or drugs or whatever bad stuff out of the body, we typically mention the liver and the kidneys, right? The liver metabolizes, so it's got a bunch of chemical reactions and then it puts waste in what? What does the liver put waste in to get rid of? the bile and then into the GI tract. Good, the leaf and the feces, perfect. So what the kidneys do then is the kidneys filter waste products out of the blood and put the waste products in what fluid? The urine, right? So the kidneys take the waste, the toxins, whatever, out of the blood, put it in the urine, and then those things leave the body via the urine. The kidneys are extremely important in getting rid of what we call nitrogenous wastes. What does nitrogenous mean? Contains nitrogen. Yeah, that doesn't sound like it's this big complicated word. It just means that the compound has nitrogen. Okay? So the kidneys are really important in getting rid of these nitrogenous wastes, like urea, your acid, creatinine. Um, we get these wastes from metabolism. So, um, like protein metabolism. Okay, so like chemical reactions where we're either making proteins or we're breaking down proteins, whenever we're processing proteins, 
we end up generating these, these byproducts that we don't use that are called like urea. Okay, it's just kind of a side effect of metabolism. We don't want it, we need to get rid of it. Okay, the kidneys are responsible for getting that out of the bloodstream, putting it in the urine, and we urinate it out. Um, creatinine, you guys remember when we talked about muscle metabolism? And we said that we can store energy in muscles as creatine phosphate, right? When we metabolize that, when we have creatine phosphate metabolism in our muscles, we create creatinine, a nitrogenous waste. Okay, so creatinine is from creatine metabolism in your muscles. The point here is that we constantly have chemical reactions happening all over the body, right? As we build up reserves, we break down reserves, we make new proteins, we break those proteins down. And all the while that we're doing this, we're generating waste products. These waste products have to be brought out of the body somehow. So the kidneys are responsible for filtering these nitrogenous wastes, putting them in the urine so that we can then get them out of the body. Bun or blood urea nitrogen is a blood test that we do clinically to monitor the level of nitrogenous wastes in your blood. And you should not have nitrogenous wastes building up to a dangerous level in your bloodstream because your kidneys should be constantly cleaning them out. If you see the bun rising, okay, the bun's going up, we say that you have azotemia, okay, so an elevated bun. And what do you think that would signal? If you've got azotemia, what would you be worried about in a patient, generally? Kidney function, right? You think, well, their kidneys probably aren't working well enough if they have these nitrogenous wastes building up in their bloodstream. Um, eventually, if that progresses far enough, you can start to see, um, like if it's really severe, you can start to see arrhythmias start to occur. Um, organ function in general will start to shut down, but arrhythmias occur and eventually it can be fatal if it goes too far. All right, so that's overall <coughs> the urinary system. We filter the blood, we take out all the stuff we don't want, but we reabsorb the things we do want. That fluid that we create is called urine. We transport it to the bladder where we store it, and then we eliminate it from the body via micturition or urination. We'll really quickly talk through the anatomy of the kidney. Um, and as we do that, we'll kind of add in little bits of physiology as we go. Like this should really be a lot of review though um, from lab. So when we look at the kidney, remember along the outside, there's this strong, fibrous, tough, um, connective tissue called the renal capsule. And there's this little indented section right here called the hilum. And remember, that's where everything enters and leaves the kidney, right? So we've got like blood vessels that come in um, and blood vessels that go out. We've got these big tubes here that collect urine and bring it down to the bladder. Um, but everything enters and leaves here at the hilum. When we look at the kidney, we can break it up into like big regions. The most superficial kind of outer area of the kidney here is called what? The cortex, right? The renal cortex. This is the outer portion that's in contact with the capsule. This is where almost all of the nephrons are. And remember the nephrons are the filtering units, right? They're the things that are actually doing the work. So that means that out in the cortex is where the filtration of blood occurs. Okay, so all the action is happening out there in the cortex. As we move in from the cortex, the next area in here is called the renal medulla. Right, so the cortex, then you go in and you find the medulla. When you look here at the renal medulla, we see numerous distinct structures called renal pyramids. So looking at the renal pyramids, they look like pyramids. Okay, they're these conical or like cone-shaped or pyramid-shaped structures. Their base or broad end goes along the cortex and then their papilla or their little tip or point projects towards the um, hilum 
which is where we have this, this renal pelvis, or this kind of like funnel that leads out of the kidney. Okay, so we've got between six and 18 of these renal pyramids structured like that. The renal pyramids are simply collecting systems. That's it. Like we're not filtering the blood in them. We're not really doing anything except collecting the urine. And we start to just bring the urine down towards the papilla, where remember eventually we'll, we'll kind of catch um, or funnel out the urine. Renal columns just refer to these bands between the pyramids. I draw it red like this because the columns are made of cortical tissue. That just means the same tissue that we see out here in the cortex. So when we look at these columns, one, they kind of act to anchor the cortex, right? And kind of like hold everything together. But what's really important is that these columns act as passageways for blood vessels to get out to the cortex. So I said that, ah, I need another color. I said that the blood vessels will come in here at the hilum, right? And they'll branch, right? They'll split, but they need to make their way out here to the cortex. This is where the blood's filtered. So the whole point is to get the blood out there. So the blood vessels can't travel through these pyramids, but these renal columns provide a nice route or a nice pathway for the blood vessels to travel out to the cortex where we can then filter it. Um, nephrons, we said, are kind of the, um, the actual functional units that are present in the kidney. Nephrons are the things that do all of the work, all of the filtering of the blood. Um, we've got millions of nephrons located in each kidney. They're microscopic, so we can't view them. Um, like when we, when we dissected the kidney, we can't actually see them. And they're located out here in the cortex of the kidney. So the nephrons, again, are where the blood is actually filtered and where the urine is produced. And when we look at nephrons, they're kind of like snakes, we said in lab. They have this, this kind of large, bulbous head. That's what we call, uh, like where the glomerulus is or where all of the capillaries are. And then they have these long, kind of twisted up tubular bodies. Okay, so like a snake with a big round head and then a long, thin body. Again, the, um, this is the, the corpuscle where we have our capillaries and then this is a long tubule. So we said that we come out here to the cortex. Again, we're just doing a super broad overview right now, um, which mostly should be review. And then I'm gonna go back in and add tons of details. But I just want you to get the overall gist and it's like, what's happening, like where the blood goes, what happens, where the urine goes, um, so that the, the details make more sense. Um, so we said that the blood comes out here to the cortex, and out here in the cortex, this is where we have all of our nephrons, right? So out here in the cortex, we've got our nephrons. This is where we actually filter the blood. After that, the blood collects, I mean, sorry, after that, we produce urine, and the urine collects in these little collecting ducts. Okay, remember that we saw these in lab, the collecting ducts will connect to lots of different nephrons and they just collect urine and travel down the pyramids. Again, we said the pyramids were just for collecting urine, right? They get a bunch of urine and they just start to bring that urine in towards the papilla. The renal papilla or renal papilla is the tip of each of these renal pyramids. Okay, so the tip of the pyramid. So at the tip of each of these pyramids, this little point right here, that's the renal papilla. And we collect urine throughout the pyramid and then it passes through this tip, through this renal papilla, into a little structure called a minor calyx. And a minor calyx, remember, is like a little cup. It's just structural, it doesn't do anything. It's just literally a funnel, like a little funnel that sits at the base of that renal papilla and just takes all of the urine from it and funnels it in towards the center of the kidney. Okay, so that's a minor calyx. At the base of this, we have another minor calyx. At the base of this papilla, another minor calyx. 
right? So we have these little funnel shaped cups called minor calluses at the, the, the tip or the papilla of each of these pyramids. Now, as these minor calluses collect urine and start to kind of come together, they'll form larger little funnels, like right here, and that's called a major callus. So multiple of these little minor funnels or minor calluses come together and they form a major callus. They are a major funnel. Multiple of these major calluses come together and they form one last big funnel as we leave the kidney. Okay, and that's called the renal pelvis. So multiple major calluses come together, one last connective tissue funnel or drain that comes here and leaves the kidney is called the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis connects to what tube? The ureter. The ureter. Good, so that connects to this tube here, which is the ureter, which is gonna bring the urine down to what? The bladder. So we can see all of this. What section is this out here? What section is this? What's this entrance? What are these? What's the tip? What's this little cup? What's this little cup? What's this little cup? What's this cup? What's this cup? Excellent. Tube? Excellent. Um, where do we, or what are these called? Columns, good. Um, where does blood enter? The renal artery, which enters at what structure? The hilum. Good. Um, where do we fill? Where are nephrons? Out here in the cortex. Where do we actually filter the blood? The nephrons out there in the cortex. Good. What are we doing here in these pyramids? We're collecting urine. Um, and what are we collecting it in? What are those things called? Collecting ducts. Good. Um, the collecting ducts will collect from tons of different nephrons, and then eventually as they pass through the papilla, they become a papillary duct, um, and then that's where it's going to actually discharge into the minor pellets, right? And then from here on out, we're just collecting urine. So we filter the blood, we make urine, we collect the urine and funnel it down, we keep funneling the urine, and then it leaves the kidney via the ureter. That's our overall gist of what's happening. So the function of the kidneys, remember, is to filter the blood. So they obviously have a huge blood supply, 